you. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can navigate in that. All right, cool. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Manasi. Um, I am the founder uh, and CEO of Bird.ai. I am also joined by our CTO, Conrado, who's hanging out there. Um, so hard questions, some of them I might send them him this way. But uh, we'll see how that goes. So super excited to be here and speaking about model versioning. Uh, this is a topic that I worked on for my PhD and have been building systems in this area for about five years. So would like to share how um, our understanding of model versioning has evolved and share some thoughts around why you should be doing model versioning. I heard some conversations before that, well, why do you care about having more than two versions of a model? And hopefully this will um, illustrate why that might be a good idea. And uh, we'll keep this pretty interactive. It's a small group, so feel free to ask questions as we go along. Cool. A uh, bit about us. We are a small company based in Palo Alto. Whoever came up from South Bay, like us, kudos to us all <laughs> for surviving <laughs> that particular commute. <laughs> Um, so we're based in uh, Palo Alto, like I said, and my background is that I got my PhD from the CCL group. Um, I used to work in databases, so large-scale data systems is what I've worked on throughout grad school. Created this open source system called ModelDB. It's a database for models, um, and that was really motivated by the kinds of workloads we were seeing out there, which is people were building a lot of models, they were not really keeping track of them, and these models were being used to make pretty key decisions across the enterprise. So that was the motivation for ModelDB. We got a bunch of open source adoption. It also ended up inspiring other open source and proprietary tools in the space, so it was very cool to watch. And uh, I was privileged to also do applied ML um, at a bunch of the large companies. In particular, I worked on the feed ranking for Twitter. So hopefully your news feed is a little bit better because of the work that my team did. So as I mentioned, Conrado is the CTO at Verda. Um, he and I worked together at Twitter. Um, he was the tech lead on the Twitter ML platform called Cortex. There are a bunch of really cool blog posts out there if you're interested, and most recently uh, on the NVIDIA self-driving car platform. So we bring kind of an interesting mix of cutting edge research along with production chops. And what we do is we have built a platform building off of model DB to do versioning, deployment, debugging, which I think is really cool and important for ML models, and then monitoring. Today I'll just be talking about versioning because in our view that is where it all starts. And hopefully I'll convince you guys to do, uh, to do versioning if you don't already. Cool. So why must I version models? Well, machine learning in practice is messy. How many people here build ML models? Okay, wonderful. This should look very familiar. Until your model is accepted or you're tired and just want to go home, <laughs> you're going to do this. You're going to specify a model, train, evaluate, debug, and refine. And my code always starts off looking really pristine. You know, I'm just reading a Spark frame and then you know, applying something to it. Accuracy not so great. Keep going, add a UDF, change the kind of classifier that I'm building. Do that some more, and now I have a hyperparameter search. By the time I had 50, woo, um, I have no idea how I got there. And the analogy to kind of software engineering is that in software, you know what the requirements are, you know what the tests are, and then you can keep trying until you get there. In ML, however, the requirements are fuzzy. We don't really know how to test our models quite yet. And it's very empirical, which means it's trial and error you try a lot of variations, and those variations actually matter because they inform feature exploration. That's how Bayesian optimization for hyperparameter searching and all of that works. So what we did um, at MIT was that we looked at Kaggle, and we looked at the competitions on Kaggle, the top 10 uh, teams that competed in every competition, and we looked at the number of submissions here. So as you can tell, a lot of those numbers are above 100. So people are building way over 100 models before they can identify one that they want to put into production. And this is only real submissions. Hyperparameter searches are usually not on there. It's so like multiply that by 10, and that's usually the total number um, that someone builds. So while we're building all of these models, we are not keeping track of them very well. So the state of the art looks as follows. Anyone does that? <laughs> my final final, my best, submitted to NeurIPS, all of that fun stuff. 
Um, or this one is from an actual Kaggle kernel. And someone is actually tracking each version of their models by adding a little comment. Now, if you're a software engineer and you do that, um, you will either quit the job or you shall be asked to quit the job. But for a data scientist, we do that all the time. Another thing that happens is it's hard to share these models, as you might imagine. This is some Slack messages a friend shared with me, and it says, um, does anyone know if so-and-so ever updated her notebook to fix the issue with the dependencies, something like that? Apart from that, we're close to deploying, right? You guys, this will, these will power our self-driving cars, and we need to hold ourselves. Uh, we need to, to do much better here. So we're optimistic that we can build a robust system to do model versioning. And I'll talk about how we did that at ModelDB and now um, how we're doing that at Verda. OK, so before I move on, just to summarize, if someone asks you why should you care about model versioning, there are four key things. One is safety. You want to know what version of your model is deployed. If a model is breaking, you need to roll back. You want to have high speed of delivery. So if you are on Git, then you can use CI CD systems like Jenkins in order to build and deploy your models. You want insurance. So if you're a team lead um, and if someone leaves your team, how do you preserve their knowledge? And we have had to do this multiple times. At a large social media company, um, we spent about two months recreating models just because the person who created them had left the company and there was no trace of what they did there. And the last one is productivity. If I'm a data scientist, I really want to know what I did before so that I can determine where to go next. So a bit about ModelDB. Uh, it's still an open source project. Verdon now um, sort of maintains it. And it became fairly successful, at, particularly for a research project, was adopted at some of um, at those companies along with research groups and startups. And we're really kind of carrying the torch forward from there. All right, so that's why. Let's go on to very briefly when must you version models. And um, we'll make this interactive. When must you version models? Like, at what time? Yeah. Now. Yes, OK. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, in the life cycle of a model, when would you want to version it? Maybe that's. When you're training. So you need to do it yesterday, absolutely. So I would argue that you need to version them when you're building them, just as you version code when you're developing a piece of software. If you're only versioning the artifacts or the pickle files or the checkpoints from your TensorFlow model, it's too late because you're not able to go back and see where the model came from. And as we all know here, development is just one part of the whole model lifecycle. We also do deployment, and we want to know what version of the model is deployed, something's breaking. When you're monitoring, you want to know if there's drift. Um, and the key point here being, if you version models in the first place, you can actually read the benefits across the entire life cycle. All right. So let's get to the meat of the talk. Um, how do I version my models? And this has to do with the fact uh, that models are a little bit different from just usual code, and it's as follows. So let's maybe begin here. Um, the key reasons why we're doing this is we want to know the state of deployed models at all times. Second, we want to be able to reproduce a model. If you guys work in a regulated industry like AI for um, insurance or fintech, then being able to reproduce a model for a regulatory body becomes a pretty key um, use case for you and then preserving work and analysis. So let's think about the ingredients of a model, right? Um, we have the code. Here's an experiment that I ran. If I want to recreate this particular model, then I need the code. The second one, if anyone wants to yell it out, um, we think that there are four key pieces to a model version. Someone want to yell out others, and we'll just go through this fairly quickly. Thank you. OK, perfect. Did not plan, but config. Um, so you can have the same code. My code is identical. What I'm going through is I'm cycling through all the hyperparameters and then building different models. So the same code is producing different models. And therefore, I also need to associate the hyperparameter values that were used um, in every execution. All right. Um, so I want to hazard a guess for number three. 
Thank you. Perfect. Um, I'll come back to that one. Data. Your, if your data is different, your model is different. And right now, we don't do a very good job of tracking where our data comes from. So in this case, I'd stored a particular file to disk. And it turned out that it was a post-process file in which I dropped a column already. So the next time when I run it, um, it told me, hey, you don't have a column that you were expecting to have. So small things that, like that end up affecting <coughs> the model significantly. And the final one that I'll mention here uh, that is super key for production environments is what are the dependencies for the model? All of us, I think, work in Python. Um, Python 2, Python 3, Python 3.6, 3.5, scikit-learn, TensorFlow, all of that needs to be captured in the way where your training environment actually turns out to be the same as your production environment. And the reason why we think that we want to separate out the components of a model version into four parts as opposed to, hey, let's just build a Docker container and then we'll be done with it. Absolutely, you can build a Docker container. But hopefully, you're going to reuse this data across multiple models, or you want to share the features. In that case, taking a more modular approach to model versioning is a more effective, effective way to go. So there are two. So we covered um, code, data, config, and environment. There are two model-specific wrinkles that come up. One is what we call model artifacts. These are the pickle files, um, the checkpoints, and so on. The fact is model training can take a long time, particularly for deep learning models. And so unlike a Jenkins build, which will you know, take 10 minutes or so, your models are going to take a long time to build. And so you might want to store intermediate states of your model as you go along. And the sort of poor man's version of model versioning is, hey, at least version your model artifacts, because then you can roll back more easily. However, if you want the whole sort of robustness associated with model versioning, you want to do the entire thing. And the last ML-specific wrinkle is versioning is fine, um, except if you think about Git, Git has no concept of what is a hyperparameter and what is just another variable in your code. However, as a data scientist, you care a ton about what your hyperparameters are. You're going to want to analyze them afterwards, graph them, search them, and so on. And so as we're thinking about model versioning, we also need to think about the metadata we want to associate with it so that we can reuse it later for queries, visualization, and so on. Make sense so far? Awesome. OK. So some total is when you're thinking about model versioning and you want to implement it in your own company, you're thinking about the model, the code, config, data, and environment. So those are things that you want to capture. And there are different ways to capture it. And I'll talk about how we particularly do it in our system. Let me briefly touch upon what this means for the ML workflow. Because we work in Jupyter Notebooks or Python scripts, whatever is appropriate. And in that case, we start with some notebook. We're reading from either a file on disk, MySQL, S3, maybe something more complicated, Kafka Stream. And what we think is the right way to architect the system is to have a model repository, a model versioning system that is a combination of a Git server that is going to track all of your code, also your environment if it's being stored in a requirements or an environment.yaml file. You need a database. So let me start from the numbering, actually. So as you start running your Jupyter Notebook, you want to snapshot the code because you want to be able to go back to that. Next, you're probably going to read the data in from a database. And that's the time when you want to version the data, because that's where you know what the state the database was in. Next, you're going to train the model. And as you're training the model, that's a time when you can start shoving metadata about your model into some sort of database. This can be your hyperparams, but more often it turns out to be tags, like hey, this particular model um, is a logistic regression, perhaps, or you have metrics that are created during training time. Finally, when you have the stored, when you have the trained model, you want to store it into some sort of artifact or blob store. And you could technically store it into Git, except these files tend to be very large. And that's where a system like S3, Artifactory, whatever is appropriate, just an NFS uh, sort of file system, that thing also suffices. 
So when we're actually talking about a model versioning system, we're talking about three very separate components. And if you end up removing or ignoring any of these, then you get kind of an inadequate experience for the data scientist. All right, so how do we implement it? Um, in model DB, let's call it V1, because V2 is coming next year. Um, in model DB V1, at that time, Kubernetes was not really a thing, so we were just based on APIs. You know, here is my hyperparameter, I'm going to go store it. Um, here is my metric, I'm going to go store it. So in the new version, we decided to approach this um, taking inspiration from how Kubernetes is architected. So we have resources, so to speak. Um, we have code, we have config, we have data and environment, the same things as before. And what we ended up doing was providing users of the system a way to either supply these as YAML files. So you can have your data YAML that's going to specify, here's a query that I'm running, here's a timestamp that's going a bit more into data versioning that I'll touch upon briefly. Or you can have a YAML file that specifies your config. So that's one way to do it. The other way that I think data scientists find much more appealing is an API-based method. And I'll show you uh, very briefly what that looks like within ModelDB. That's an API-based method that lets you log code, that lets you log your data sets, your environment, and so on. So that's how we think about um, a model version. So effectively, our model version SHA, so to speak, is a combination of these four SHAs that have been gotten by these disparate systems. Okay, um, questions so far before I go to how do I branch and merge, um, which is, yeah. Yeah, so we define that there needs to be a Python version if you're in Python, if you're in R, something else. And we need dependencies. We also need what hardware you're running on, because if you're on the TPU, then it's going to be very different from, say, the CPU. On the hardware, how far do you have to constrain that problem? Because you don't get the same answer from two different generations of TPU. 100%. Um, that was something that even with floating points and um, things like that, it's. Um, then you can't reproduce the test because hardware doesn't exist. And if you under-constrain, you get a different answer. Yep, yep. Um, so all of these are YAML specifications where it, our minimum bar is we need to know Python and your dependencies and also what hardware, like at the level of CPU, TPU, or GPU. Other than that, we're not as picky, but it might make sense to add more annotations there, 100%. Yeah, um, and I think that's a, that's a result of the stochasticity of how models are built. It's not a deterministic system, so um, we're going to have to deal with that. So it's also precision issues on hardware. Absolutely. You could have everything else the same, and precision issues would give you a Yeah, um, and perhaps then adding the precision there too might be a good way to go for those settings. Um, so here, it's a YAML file. Um, our abstraction at the back end is kind of a key value. If you want to put in more key values, if you're familiar with annotations on Kubernetes, you can add in, hey, precision matters to me. But yeah, uh, so far, we don't work with a lot of folks who are using TPUs, to be honest, and so we haven't yeah. run into that as much. Yeah. So I think it's not unique to TPUs. Yeah, I think the challenge is that there is a problem of, I want to reproduce my model versus I want to know what I can those are two separate questions that people are asking. We don't want to constrain so that if you want to know where it came from, you don't care about reproducing, you need less information. Yes. And we don't want to force everybody to have to be on the second bucket. So by providing some baseline, and you can extend as much as you want to add every piece of information, you can have as much knowledge in the future as you want. Yeah, I'm just trying to go from the point of view of not everybody knows that there's an issue. So if you don't tell them there's an issue, they're going to serve you well. That's a fair point. And maybe like imposing a um, sort of more, a larger set of requirements might be a way to fix that in the future. So yeah. Not yeah, yeah. That's fair. Awesome. Thank you. OK, uh, to kind of summarize that, if you, in your environment, make sure that you're tracking what hardware you ran on, what was the precision, things like that, and know that you're going to have little changes in your weights and things that are going to come up because of set issues. Awesome. OK. So the natural question is, hey, you're talking about versioning. How do I branch and merge? Now, if you take the approach that what we're thinking about are really YAML files for all of these resources, then 
this is not terribly different from making PRs against a Kubernetes or a Helm chart, where you're saying my config changed in this particular fashion, or my, um, my sort of config.yaml changed, or my environment.yaml changed. And so making PRs actually is pretty much the same. People always wonder, hey, how do you actually make PRs against uh, for models? What does it mean to fork a model? And the key idea that we found here is models are a result of these four components. So figure out which one of those components is changing, and then think about forking off that piece first, and then merging it back in. A really big, hairy question here is also data versioning because data lives in very disparate systems. It might be a file system, a blob store, a database. And versioning ends up looking very different for each one of these systems. What we have chosen to do is we have written connectors for different kinds of data stores, and we are only exposing a uniform versioning schema depending on the kind of system you're living in. So what do I mean by that? Um, if you're working in an RDBMS, then we assume two things. We assume that your records have timestamps and it's an append only. It's very similar to how Vertica, um, popular column store, does this. So if we have the timestamp, uh, then we're always able to recreate the data that existed when you ran that particular query. In that case, our schema for the RDBMS is just what is the query you ran, when did you run it, and then we're counting on a connector to Vertica or another column store to be able to fetch that data again. There are, if you talk about blob stores, S3 has a way to version um, each of your objects on S3. And so where appropriate, we found that falling back to the existing system support um, is a good way to go. But this is an active area of work for us, for a lot of people here as well, because you can't just go around storing copies of your data. And if you end up having a, a workload that is a lot of updates as opposed to just appends, then you can quickly run into scalability issues. But happy to talk more offline on this. Uh, we are actively figuring out what is the best way to version data in the variety of systems that we work with right now. Awesome. So I will do a brief demo to kind of show you what model DB v2 looks like within our system and show you, highlight what the data versioning gets you and things like that. And after that, I will open for questions. Cool. Um, the stuff is open source, so feel free to check it out after. And uh, our requirement is that you're on Kubernetes, and we have Helm charts that you can apply. Yes? Can you tell me how this would be different from just using like, model DB if I hosted it myself? Um, you can, absolutely. So things that are different here are more, or, are more along the deployment and monitoring side. So if you just want to do model versioning, use model DB, you're going to be great. Yes? A little, a little higher, a little higher you broke it into four, four mm -hmm. areas. Is this one big config file in root, or are these four config files, one the data directory, one the model directory? We prefer them to be separate, just so that you can, it's more manageable, because some of these become very, very long and very involved quickly, particularly if you're thinking about I have a large neural network architecture, then perhaps you want to reuse that file in another piece of code where you're reading it in and then you're creating a graph from it, something like that. So we would recommend keep it separate, but you can experiment with sticking it all together too. Some of the things stay static while there's a change. Exactly. Yep, just like modularity um, is okay. what we're going for. Yes? Since you led into that question, I was going to ask you, which is uh, sampling transfer learning. I'm referencing another model that I'm going to make a model dependent upon. Yeah. I do the same thing with ensemble. Is this a model repo architecture or is it a, you know, you got to have with, you know, is everything a one giant repo? And how do I do a transfer of any model? Or can I have pointers to external Git? Right. Um, we've seen people do it both ways, and we try not to be that opinionated about it, because ensembles is something that lots of people do out there. So what they'll do is they'll have a different repo per, let's say, like constituent model, and then they'll have another repo that brings in those models and then stitches it into a larger one. And that lets them iterate independently. Might not work for all cases, though. If your goal is reproducibility, or, or at least no more something came from, you have to have some rules about 
the external reference. So you have a reference to the version of every model that you're stitching together. So suppose your ensemble is, I'm adding up four things, and I have what version each one of those four things were. Perhaps I'm missing something. Yes, so for every model, you're actually picking a particular SHA that you're saying, hey, I'm going to include this in my model. It's just another model record. It's just a model record for us. Does that? Because the one of our users right now builds, they're doing kind of what Google does, except on a smaller scale, much smaller scale. Um, they're scraping web pages, they're building 40 yard classifiers, and then they're combining them to give them a top level classifier. And what they do in that case is they have separate projects for every one of those 40 classifiers. They are picking a particular model version for every project and then using it in a top level project. I mean, the example I'll think of is you take Google's <laughs> machine vision mm -hmm. things and slap out your classifier at the end. Right. I think the Google one is changing all the time. Right. So that was. Right, so you would want to. Maybe an external reference is something that you know is changing all the time. That would be pretty explicit. And it's outside of that model out of your you can reference the version in theory as long as they actually get it available. And you can reference the shop. Yeah. Again, for producing these things, there's no great part. The shop will be some part. Yes. And I would say like this is not very different from having dependency pins for your Python libraries. So trying to impose that for models too. What is shop uh, used for? Uh, it's a hash, sorry. What do you use that for? It's a metadata that you can store that refers to its business. It's a unique identifier for essentially every single entity. Assuming they have a condition, which I hope you know. Like, let me give you an example. Like, we use it for version, we like, track it, and we use it for in your project. Right? I guess that it's a like, what information are you hashing? Yep. OK. Um, maybe I'll jump here, and that might answer some of your questions. All right. Uh, the mental model is of GitHub, essentially, where you have a bunch of these repos, which for us are projects within a particular repo. You have experiments, which are similar to branches. An experiment run is similar to a commit, so to speak. And each one of these commits has a SHA associated with it. So that's a unique identifier for this particular model record. And that, in turn, comes from a unique SHA for, sorry, click the wrong thing. That comes from a unique SHA of your data. It also has a unique SHA for your code version, which I thought I, there we go. OK, uh, unique SHA for your code version. Also, whatever hyperparameters that you used, as well as the requirements file. So essentially, the SHA is a unique identifier for your model. Awesome. So that's our setting. This is just uh, what we had with model DB. And we found that just having a central place where you can see all of your work so far is pretty powerful. Unlike your git commits, you don't usually go and analyze your git commits uh, to see kind of where you messed up, I guess. However, for models, you end up doing that a lot. So think about what it means to review a particular model in order to put it into production. If I'm managing a bunch of people, then I want to know, hey, so like you tried a bunch of things. What is the space that you explored? Um, one thing that my pet peeve is I want error bars on things because I don't know kind of are you cherry picking a particular value? Uh, things like that. Also looking at whether you have explored the hyperparameter space adequately and you can build your custom charts and things like that. But the key point here being um, for commits, you don't care as much about the metadata associated with it, whereas for models, you care about the metadata immensely. And so it's a first class citizen in our system. Now, since it's a versioning system, you can compare models. In this case, I'm comparing these two models. They have different IDs, which are the SHAs associated with them. And you can see what changed in uh, the inputs to the model. So hyperparams, metrics, of course. If you're these are just attributes or metadata. So if your features ended up changing, um, in this case, my data set actually was different. And so it's telling me, hey, your ID seem to be different. You might want to go and see what's wrong with your data set. You also 
can see that the Git code is different. Um, and these, as they link to the GitHub, you can actually compare them, and we're just linking to GitHub. There's nothing kind of rocket science-y uh, going on there. Now, I'll touch upon data versioning. So in the previous one, we saw that the data sets were different, and very reasonably, you might want to know what changed. So this is a simple case where I was just reading a data from S3, and it turned out that um, I had gone off and I had added a new file to our demo directory. In this case, it didn't have a direct impact on my model because this is a different data set. Um, so this is the kind of interesting thing that goes on. Um, just judging from the fact that the data sets were different, you couldn't have made out whether it would have impacted your model. So there's still some human in the loop or human intervention required while making these sorts of calls. So the final thing here I want to mention before handing it off to questions and the next speaker is once you version models as you're building them, you actually have all the ingredients you need in order to deploy it. So when you're deploying a model, most people today are dockerizing their models, um, which we think is the right way to go unless you also have a Lambda setting and so on, a separate conversation. If you already are storing your environment, which is your requirements.txt, if you're storing the data it came from, the artifacts, then deploying becomes just a one click. I'm not going to demo it here, happy to do it offline, because that's not the topic here. And you can also do interesting things like defining a particular model API. So if I build a model, uh, someone else is going to use it, I hope. So I want to tell them, hey, I expect to get this set of, um, I need to get 40 inputs, I want to produce one output. You can also start associating distributions with it so that you can do interesting things with it, like monitoring downstream. But you get all of that, the key point is from doing versioning. And so my key takeaway for everyone in the room is, as you're building your models, think about how you can very easily track all of this data. And I will quickly show you what it looks like with a ModelDB client. So for the ModelDB client, it's based on APIs, unless you're using the configs that I mentioned before. You log hyperparameters. You go off and you log attributes. Um, you can log metrics. You can log your requirements. You can log your data set, and you can log your code. So instead of doing a lot of data scientists don't want to think about YAML or work in a different fashion, in that case, we found that this abstraction turns out to be pretty helpful and easy to use. So this is the for this level of extra effort, you end up getting a lot in return. And so as you guys are thinking about how to implement this, think about how to minimize effort for your data science team um, as they are building models. Any questions? OK, awesome. Um, so that was a quick demo. And to briefly summarize, version your models, it will pay off dividends um, many fold. And Conrado and I would be happy to take questions. Yeah, so uh, the versioning is the same. It doesn't do deployment and monitoring, um, also debugging, which gets more into explainability, so to speak. Um, so the operationalization is on the Verda platform. But the versioning is in ModelDB. We think. Yeah, exactly. So we use the same basic abstractions, and we pick them in that way. Yeah. yeah. Yes? An early version is already on the Vert AI um, GitHub, if you want to give the early version a try. But Q1 is when we're going to do a more public release of it. Yep. Um, and if you send me an email, I will be sure to ping you when it's live. Yep. Um, so if you look at V1, it was, it had, it was a research artifact. <laughs> Let's not get into all the issues that were going on with V1. Um, but we did get a lot of great people using it. We have rewritten it from the ground up. Um, and so our backend systems are way more robust. It used to be MongoDB. It's now a relational database, which can be plugged in and out. We transition. Yes. <laughs> um, we also transition from Thrift to gRPC, because it was easier. We have introduced data versioning. Model v one did not have data versioning. Um, and all of this works on Kubernetes now. That's where we run our systems. And so way more robust. And we've scale tested it to millions of models. So like, we can stand behind the fact that it's going to work at scale. Awesome. Thanks very much. <laughs>